Okay, everyone. Welcome to the fourth session of Forest Relief of Missouri's Tree Keepers, Tree Selection and Planting. This is re-recorded from our first session, which we experienced some technical difficulties and we lost the recording. So without further ado, I'm going to go ahead and skip the housekeeping and all that general stuff and just go ahead with it. Uh, my name is Mark Halpin. I'm the forestry manager for Forest Relief of Missouri. I'll be taking you through tree planting and tree selection. So the wrong tree and the wrong site can be more of a liability than an asset. Um, most of the problems you're going to encounter with trees really originate from poor selection, just putting the wrong tree in the wrong place. So we're going to cover selection first in this presentation. We're going to move on to the actual nuts and bolts of planting after that. But really, before you even consider planting a tree, before you consider digging a hole, you really need to make sure that you have the right tree selected for the location. And it's really not too, too complicated. Um, trees have some basic cultural requirements. All trees need light to varying degrees. Some need uh, pretty much full sun all day long. Some need almost shade all the time and everything in between. Water requirements, likewise, some trees will grow in standing water, actually in a, a pond or a swamp, like bald cypress or pond cypress. Um, soil conditions varying from sandy to rocky to clay. Growing space is a huge consideration. You need to understand how much root, root space the tree is going to need to occupy. You're also going to need to consider how big the crown is going to get and if it's going to fit in the area you have. And other, of course, there's always other. Um, we have some trees that have kind of unique niche habits and uh, we'll discuss some of that further in the presentation. Environmental characteristics, so temperature extremes. Um, every Every part of the country is going to have its own palette of trees. There's going to be a lot of overlap in that. St. Louis is kind of right on a transition zone where we can grow some southern species and a lot of northern species that, um, you know, as you get into to Minnesota or Louisiana, those palettes are going to change. Um, we're kind of in a middle point here. Um, soil pH is a huge factor to consider too. Typically in urban areas and even suburban areas, we're going to be experiencing higher than optimal soil pH, more alkaline conditions than we would like. Light levels, again, from shade to full sun, and of course, that other. So site analysis is what you're going to do before you consider what kind of tree you're going to plant. You're just going to look at the, the site you have that you'd like to have a tree on with all of the factors we just discussed in mind. Um, and you're also gonna look at what has happened in this site in the past. Um, has there been construction here? Has there, uh, has there been heavy equipment coming through this area? Um, anything that could disturb the soil. If you remember our uh, discussion last week with Hank Stelzer, he discussed compaction and the negative impact that has on root development. Um, those are really the big things. You know, if you're really lucky, you're going to have a site that is just undisturbed soil that's just been, you know, sitting there for hundreds of years. That's pretty unlikely for most of us. Um, so consider all of those things to the best of your knowledge. Um, you know, if maybe you moved into a new house, look around to see if maybe the patio just got redone, if there was an addition put on, things like that. So some considerations to, uh, to further look at, a big one is going to be utilities, overhead and underground. You're going to have to call dig right um, to get locates done before you plant a tree. It is the law, so regardless of how well you think you know the area, just go ahead and do that. It's free, they're responsive, they'll be out in typically less than a week to mark those utilities. Overhead utilities should be pretty obvious. You're gonna to wanna to select a tree that is not going to get as tall as uh, the placement of those power lines. You know, power lines can be anywhere from 12 to 40 feet off the ground. 
So you're just going to have to work with that um, because if you interfere with those power lines too much, um, the utility company is going to come along and they're going to prune that tree pretty severely. And you can't really blame them because trees are great, but electricity is an extremely important part of how our society functions. And they're doing their best to keep us all with good electrical service. Um, things like sidewalks, paved surfaces are a huge consideration. We've all seen what happens when a tree is planted too close to a paved surface and those roots start to interfere with it. You know, they'll, uh, they'll destroy concrete or asphalt or anything like that. Um, and then someone's probably gonna wanna replace that surface and then they're gonna destroy the tree in the process of doing that most likely. So keep them, um, you're gonna wanna keep them a good distance away from paved surfaces. Again, that's gonna depend on the tree. Intersections, you don't wanna create safety issues by blocking anyone's line of vision. Um, also, you know, if you're planting closer to the street, you wanna consider stop signs and any other relevant traffic signs. Plans for future development is a huge one too. Um, it's no fun to plant a tree somewhere, have it, you know, get through that establishment phase. And then five years later, someone decides that they're gonna put a pavilion or a, a sidewalk going right through it and you've just wasted all that time caring for that tree. You're going to want to consider wa water availability because for the first three years, at least, you're going to need to provide supplemental water for this tree. Um, type of soil is going to affect how often you're going to need to water. Um, if you have a very sandy, well-draining soil, you're going to need to water more often. Clay, it's going to be less. Um, but you also want to consider what water is just going to find its way there naturally in the form of runoff, um, in the form of rain, just kind of naturally pooling in some areas, downspouts, funneling water. Um, if you have a low area, you're gonna need to be really careful with your species selection because um, chances are that area is gonna remain fairly moist for long periods of time. Again, soil conditions like pH, nutrients, uh, salts that might be in that soil from, uh, especially if you're close to a road, or any sort of surface that's going to be de-iced in the winter. Um, those de-icing products can really mess with the soil and make it challenging to establish trees there. But there are trees that will that will do fine in those areas. Um, drainage, again, that's largely dependent on soil type, but also if the soil has been, been messed with, if it's been compacted. Um, bulk texture and bulk density, cation exchange capacity, soil volume. Um, again, get a soil test. It's worth the money. It's not, not real expensive, you know, for a tree, which is ideally an investment that's going to outlive you and uh, an investment for future generations. So putting a little bit of time and money into ensuring that you actually understand what kind of soil you're working with is going to pay off huge. And of course, light levels again, um, don't plant a, a full sun tree in a shady area and don't plant a shade loving tree in a full sun area. And hardiness zones, um, as much as you might love to have a live oak in your backyard, it's not gonna happen around here. Um, we're, gonna, we're working within the confines of where we are. Um, people can do some amazing things with, you know, babying trees and creating microclimates for them. Um, you know, they do some amazing things at the botanical gardens with that. But for most of us, we're not going to want to put in that amount of time and energy and constantly be fighting nature just to kind of put on a show. So you're going to want to work with a tree that's well adapted to the area you're living in. You're also going to want to consider other plantings like trees and shrubs, um, things like that, maybe annual beds, anything that, you know, might involve you, might involve that tree coming into conflict with other plants. Um, it's not necessarily a conflict. It can be a great thing if you have, um, you know, maybe a perennial bed around a tree, you know, a little bit of root disturbance you might have to do from time to time to, to transplant or, uh, you know, divide some of those perennials might not be a huge deal. What you really want to avoid is when people want to mound soil up around the base of a tree to plant annuals in it every year. Um, it's really not good for the tree long run. But integrating trees into shrub beds and perennial beds can be a great way to uh, get rid of some of the conflicts we, we encounter with having to mow around trees. I'll talk about that later on too, because that's a huge uh, cause of premature death in our landscapes, especially in areas like parks and things like that. Um, 
And just consider the maintenance that you're going to need to provide this tree. You're going to need to water it. Um, it says irrigation here. Typically, people have irrigation systems set up in their yards for turf. And turf irrigation regimens are not good for trees. Turf typically likes uh, the roots aren't particularly deep on turf. Um, so because of that, usually frequent shallow watering is what people give the turf grass. And typically it's more frequent and more shallow than it even should be. Whereas a tree wants extremely deep infrequent watering. It wants the, the roots want to dry out completely between waterings, not necessarily for a long time, again, depending on the species and the weather conditions, but you do want the soil to dry out completely between waterings. So if you have your, your pop-up heads programmed for turf, that is not going to be good for your trees, and you cannot rely on that to water your tree effectively for you. So you're going to need to do some tinkering with that. Post planting care, mulching is going to be a big one. Again, I'll go into more detail about a lot of this stuff later. And ongoing maintenance, such as pruning, um, especially if it's going to be a really large canopy tree, um, consider how it's going to be accessed by someone that might need to prune it. And design criteria. Um, and, you know, this, this varies all over the place from if you want a very formal looking a formal looking landscape versus more of an informal one. You know, if you're planting a tree out kind of by a, you know, if maybe your house butts up to kind of like a wood line or something like that, um, it's going to be different. But consider what you want this tree to do. Is it just there to look pretty? Are you trying to maybe block um, some sun from hitting your house to help cool your house, maybe save you a little bit on your energy bill? Are you trying to block wind from hitting your house maybe in the winter? To, uh, to save on your heating bill? Um, are you trying to hide something maybe you don't like, maybe uh, you know, your air conditioner, if you live out in the country, maybe like a septic tank that you wanna hide. Maybe you don't like the way your neighbor's house looks and you wanna hide that. Maybe you don't like your neighbor and you wanna build a living fence to, to hide their property from you. Um, there are all sorts of things we can use trees to do. And um, you wanna have a good idea of what you want this tree to do. And so considerations for, for the different species you're going to encounter. Growth rate, of course, we all would like a tree to get huge and impressive very quickly, but in almost every case with a couple very notable exceptions that I'll discuss at the end of this, but typically when you ask for a fast growth rate, you're sacrificing wood strength. Uh, trees that grow fast tend to live fast and die young and break apart. By young, it's relative in tree terms, but you know, 50, 60, 70 years, you know, for something like a cottonwood, which would be super fast growing and it'll get super huge in a very short amount of time. Whereas if you want something that's extremely strong wooded, like a white oak, like a post oak, you know, it's going to not even your grandkids are going to see an impressive tree if you plant a post oak in your yard. Um, but, you know, there's some nice middle ground there where you can get a, a pretty decent tree in your lifetime and not have to sacrifice, not have to worry about it collapsing and destroying your home or taking your gutters out or something like that. Um, but, you know, size at maturity really needs to be considered. Just because you really like a tree doesn't mean you should plant it in your yard. And you need to go out and just do an honest assessment of how much root space you're going to be able to offer this tree and how much canopy space you're going to be able to offer it. Um, now, you can play around with that stuff a little bit if you're willing to really diligently prune a tree. But once a tree gets up to a, a decent size, unless you're a climbing arborist, in which case I don't know why you're taking this class because it's a uh, your tree knowledge should be much more advanced than what we're offering here. Um, but unless, unless you're willing to prune a large canopy tree pretty frequently, um, you're going to have a hard time containing it in an area that's too small for, for what it needs. So just be realistic about how big a tree is going to get and how big of an area you can offer it. Um, you know, of course, you can plant that tree and kind of leave it for the next generation to deal with when it, when it gets overgrown. But, um, you know, we face a lot of that currently tree managers, you know, we deal with 
selections that were made in the past that way. And we're left with having to remove a tree prematurely. It's a really expensive process. Um, the money that goes to those removals takes away from money we could be spending on, on other plantings to keep our, keep, keep our cities and suburbs nice and green. So, um, you know, I know it's easy to think short term, but I think that's where a lot of our world's problems come from, from short term thinking. And when we're dealing with trees, we really need to think beyond our own lifespans and in longer terms. Consider the habit and the form. Um, part of this is just aesthetic. What do you want it to look like? Uh, but it can also, you know, have an impact on proximity to buildings. You know, if it's a tree that tends to grow um, kind of straight outward, it's going to it's gonna get to a building quicker and start to conflict with it. Whereas if you have a more upright growing tree, um, you might be able to plant that a little closer to a building and not have to worry about that so much. Um, so an important thing to consider. And of course, insect and disease resistance. This is a huge one. This is why we can't plant ash anymore. This is why we have to be very cautious about using elms. This is why we should be cautious about using um, some red maples and uh, all sorts of species that have just started to, to develop some of these problems. And it's also a big part of the reason why we need to be diverse in our plantings. And we can't just keep using the same species just because they're popular. They might be great trees. They might look, look wonderful and be really easy to manage. But if we overuse them, we're just setting ourselves up for the problems inherent with planting monocultures, which again is um, what we're experiencing now with emerald ash borer or what we experienced in the past with Dutch elm disease. So pH requirements, we've talked about that a little bit. Typically trees are gonna want a slightly acidic soil and typically what we're offering them is a slightly to extremely alkaline soil. Um, typically you're gonna wanna look for a tree that can tolerate some of that alkalinity unless you have pretty nice soil that's just somewhat on the acidic side. Salt tolerance, again, huge. If you're gonna be planting it anywhere near a paved area, that's gonna get de-iced in the winter. Um, that's something you can't ignore because that salt will, will cause serious issues otherwise. And just consider known problems. Um, these are pretty well known with some trees like pests, like hopefully we all know about emerald ash borer now. Poor structure, Bradford pear, for example, is famous for poor structure. People still plant calorie pear cultivars, which is kind of insane, but uh, Bradford pear is kind of famous for its poor structure. Weak wood, again, cottonwood, silver maple, two of the big ones that we still see a lot of in our landscapes that um, probably aren't appropriate to plant close to a house. Surface roots, that's kind of a, that's kind of a catch 22 because um, a, lot of, a lot of trees that tolerate urban conditions really well are just prone to putting on surface roots. And in fact, the surface roots are kind of a part of the reason why they tolerate those conditions so well. But just consider that they might be there and you're gonna to have to deal with them. You can't mulch over them because that's gonna hurt the tree. You're just gonna to have to kind of deal with them mowing around them or maybe using some chemical to control the grass around them or, or something. You're gonna to have to deal with them one way or another. Messy fruit and flowers. Um, everyone wants a beautiful flowering tree. No one wants to deal with what those flowers often turn into, which is fruit. Um, you know, nothing's perfect. We always have to make sacrifices. You know, the bigger and the showier the flower, typically the more mess it's gonna lead to. Um, so you're, you're gonna have to make some compromises here. There's, there's really no perfect tree out there that's gonna have beautiful flowers and beautiful fall color and also be super clean. Um, there's always gonna be some give and take. So just think about what you're willing to tolerate and also think about what's gonna be going on in the area. You know, like with thorns, for example, here, are there going to be a lot of kids in this area, maybe trying to climb that tree to where they're going to tear their hands open? Are you going to have to mow around it and you're going to start to really hate that tree after it ruins a couple of your t-shirts and pokes you in the eye a few times? So um, like I said, there's always going to be sacrifices and compromises. Just think about what you are willing to make and what you want out of that tree and balance those things. So maintenance requirements are gonna 
vary tremendously from tree to tree. The first three years, it's almost going to be identical for any species. You're going to have to water it probably about once a week in the summer, depending on rainfall. You're going to need to keep the root zone mulched and you're not going to want to prune it ideally for those first three years. And then beyond that, it can vary tremendously. You know, there are trees that you might expect to have to give a little bit of supplemental water to from time to time. Not too often, not too many trees like that, but if, if there's a certain tree that you're really in love with that has those requirements, be prepared to deal with that. Um, pruning is one that's gonna vary tremendously from tree to tree, how much pruning it's gonna need. Um, and also, you know, some of those pests and disease things there are certain species that we still really love to use that are just gonna require a lot more maintenance in that regard. Um, two that immediately come to mind for me are crab apples and flowering cherries. They're both just very disease prone, beautiful trees, but if you're gonna plant them, be prepared to, to be fighting some pests off. And hardiness, like I said, we're kind of right, right in the zone where we can plant Southern magnolias and crepe myrtles and things like that, that uh, will really thrive without any sort of difficulty in the south. And here we're, we're just in the danger zone where we can plant them and they will often do very well, but we might get hit with a situation where they're really gonna suffer. Um, like for Southern Magnolia, there's a cultivar Bracken's Brown Beauty that's gonna be a little better in our environment. With crepe myrtle, um, they're just gonna die to the ground if it gets cold enough. I'm pretty sure this last winter it got cold enough, typically negative five to negative 10 will kill a crepe myrtle to the ground. Um, I think we're gonna see some of that this spring. So just consider that, you know, if you wanna play with some of those more southerly species, um, you're, you're taking that risk. Tolerance to drainage issues is gonna be a huge deal in almost every case, because in almost every case we're dealing with compacted soil it's gonna be very rare that you're planting a tree in an urban or suburban environment that is not in compacted soil. And uh, luckily we have a lot of trees that deal with compaction fairly well. Um, and of course the degree of compaction can vary from, uh, from you know, minor compaction, which is an issue to, to the point where it's gonna be really difficult and you're gonna be limited to maybe a handful of possibilities because remedying compaction in an area large enough to plant a tree in is extremely difficult and just not really practical in most cases for most people. So in that case, you're probably just gonna be kind of shoehorned into picking one of a handful of trees that can deal with severely compacted soil. Uh, seed source, where did the genetics of the tree come from? Another big deal and another reason why you should really, uh, you should really try to buy from a quality local nursery because chances are, you know, if you go to, to Home Depot or any of the big box stores, um, you know, I'm not trying to knock them too much because I'll buy various hardware supplies there. But as far as those trees go, they're getting those at a discounted rate from nurseries that are probably going to be sending them stuff from out of state, far out of state. Um, you know, oftentimes that stuff's going to be coming from the Pacific Northwest, probably Oregon. Um, which, you know, it's great. They grow great trees there, but that's such a different climate from ours that, uh, uh, sorry, that those trees are going to kind of struggle to adapt to here. Um, otherwise, you know, it's also pretty likely you're going to be getting things from Kentucky, Tennessee, Ohio. Um, that's a little better. It's still quite a different climate there. If you can get something that's actually grown in Missouri, that's going to be ideal. So, Really consider that and don't just look for the cheapest tree you can get. I mean, a lot of people buy trees that are on sale and they do just fine. But um, if you really want to set yourself up for success, it's better to spend a little bit more money to ensure that you're getting a quality local grown tree. And so we have a hardiness, hardiness map here um, that you can see that, you know, we are right on the transition zone, kind of depending on where you live in St. Louis. Um, we're really on the transition zone where, you know, the prairies sort of begin to the north and west of us. The, the great, huge, expansive eastern hardwood forest kind of ends to the, to the south and east of us. 
we're right on that cusp. So it's kind of cool. It gives us a lot of opportunities. It's kind of bad because um, a lot of those, a lot of those opportunities, it's, it's not ideal, but we can get away with it. So this is an emotional issue for a lot of people, native versus introduced species. Um, I'm not a native purist. Part of that comes from the environments I've worked in, urban and suburban plantings where you're dealing with soils that have nothing to do with the native soils of Missouri and environments that have nothing to do with the native environments of Missouri. Um, things like strips between sidewalks and streets um, terribly compacted soil with, uh, you know, asphalt mixed in with it, just junk like that. Um, not saying there aren't native species that will grow in there, but the thing is before, when I talked about the importance of diversity, if we have areas like this, these really difficult areas, um, some of them we need kind of smaller trees to fit in because of utilities and because of buildings and things like that if you're going to limit yourself to native species in those areas, you're really going to be limited on the amount of, of trees you can use. Even when you're considering using introduced species, non-native species, you're still, you know, there's maybe 20, 25 species that are suitable for use for like street trees in a lot of urban areas, um, which isn't ideal. And if you, if you want to go just native, you're, you're kind of cutting that number in half. Um, Obviously you need to be really careful about which introduced species you use. And you really need to keep up with um, the research that's being done about what's invasive and what isn't. You know, there's a lot of plants that 10 years ago, no one would hesitate to recommend a, a burning bush or something like that. Um, whereas now we're seeing a lot of invasive tendencies for those species. Um, you know, calorie pear was still being recommended. Um, I don't know about 10 years ago, well, it's still being sold now. Um, but we know that that's invasive. Whereas there are other trees that have been around for um, for quite a long time that ha just haven't demonstrated that tendency. Um, I know a lot of people don't like London plane tree because of the, the whole arch grounds thing and it wouldn't be my first choice, but you know, that's a good example of, uh, I mean, that tree has been around for, I don't know, at least it's been in the United States for over a hundred years and it has no invasive tendencies that I've ever heard of. Um, so again, I know some people will probably be very offended by me saying that, but I am not a native purist. I think native should be prioritized whenever, if you can find a native to do the job, you should absolutely use it. But at the same time, I would rather have a healthy non-native tree providing a lot of good benefits for us than than no tree at all, which sometimes that's really your option. Um, and there are places where a tree is just not appropriate. You know, if it comes down to, I can have no tree or a tree of heaven, go with the no tree option by all means. Um, but I, I do think introduced species have a place in most of our, most of our urban plantings. Now, if you, if you live actually out, out in the country, um, I, I would totally avoid it because you're gonna be able to find a native that can do something for you. Um, there are a lot of really beautiful ornamental natives too. Um, part of this is just getting past our, the ingrained aesthetics we have about what a landscape should look like. And, um, you know, we become so used to the ideas of like flowering, flowering cherries and crab apples and, and certain introduced species like that. Um, sometimes it's just a matter of kind of changing your perception a little bit and uh, accepting that some of those landscape ideals are a little bit outdated and we can do better if we try to take a more scientific approach. Um, I'm not gonna go into a huge amount of detail with this, this here, but basically what this is trying to convey is that the larger caliper trunk you have, the larger root ball you're gonna need. In a lot of places are gonna to try to get by selling a smaller root ball with a larger trunk because most people just look at the trunk and that's, you know, most people, a tree starts right where it emerges from the ground and they see a big impressive trunk. They don't consider that they're kind of getting ripped off on the root ball uh, because for the first few years, all that tree is really gonna do is reestablish its root system. And if you put that small 
um, uh, underdeveloped or, or a root ball that was dug too small out of the field in the case of ball and burlap trees, that trunk isn't going to really grow for many years because that root system is going to need to catch up to it. Whereas if you plant a much smaller tree, um, you know, the three gallon trees we have at the forest relief nursery, most of them aren't very impressive when you plant them, but they, um, they're going to start to grow much, much faster than even a ball and burlap tree with, uh, with a nice size root ball because there's so little transplant shock and they don't have to redevelop that root system. Um, so really consider that. And I would always advise you to not try to plant a really huge tree. You know, if you're, if you're filthy rich and you can afford to buy a giant tree and, you know, have it babied for the first seven years, it's in the ground, you know, by all means, knock yourself out. But for most of us, uh, you know, we don't want to be dealing with the amount of water and the amount of care that those large trees are going to take. And you're much better off buying a smaller or mid-sized tree with a nice size root ball, putting it in the ground. It's going to have less transplant shock, and it's really going to catch up to those larger trees. There's actually been research done on that. Um, I, I can't think of the exact figures or anything right now, but um, a one inch tree will actually catch up to a three inch tree in the space of something like five to seven years, depending on the species. So have a little bit of patience. Patience is key to having successful tree planting. So once you've determined what species you actually want and what species is going to be appropriate for the area you're using in, and once you've realistically embraced what it is you're gonna go out to a nursery to look for, and you found a good nursery to go to. Um, once you find the actual, the actual species you're looking at, there are some things you're gonna wanna look for. Um, the large, you know, the, the root ball to, to trunk ratio is gonna be part of that. Um, but then you're also gonna wanna look at vigorous branch growth. This is one where it's, hopefully everyone remembers uh, Mark Gruber talking about internode size on trees, so the inner node is the space between, you know, last year's bud and this year's bud, and even the bud before that. Um, those internodal spaces show how much a tree has grown in a year. You're going to want, you know, a, a certain amount of consistency to that. You know, if if those internodal spaces are all very stunted and short, or if you know they're decent and then all of a sudden they get really short, that's not a good sign. You want a uh, you want to see that that tree has been growing well over the last few years. That's going to indicate that the nursery has been taking good care of it. You're going to want good branch spacing. You you don't want just branches bristling every which way out of the tree. There are exceptions to that, you know, with uh, with certain cultivars and things like that. But for the most part, you're going to want a few good, well spaced branches. Um, you're also you're going to want none of the branches to be particularly large. Um, you know, if the branches are getting to be like a third to half the size of the main trunk, you're, you're probably going to have to remove those depending on, depending on the species and the kind of growth habit you want. Um, the trunk taper is a very important one to look at. You want a thick trunk. Um, a lot of times you're going to find, especially at nurseries where they've removed a lot of the lower branches um, because that's kind of, it looks good. You know, people see that and they think they're not going to have a lot of trouble mowing around that tree, um, but that actually slows down the development of trunk taper. Um, and then we'll talk about the root flare later, which is related to trunk taper. Um, foliage evenly distributed in the upper two thirds. So this gets back to that limbing a tree up prematurely. The top two thirds of that tree should have healthy branches on it. Only the bottom third at most should be limbed up. Avoid many upright branches. Um, these are gonna be uh, co-dominant stems in a lot of cases. Um, we typically want one strong central leader. Single trunk with spreading branches. This is that central leader. Um, we talked a little about decurrent and next current growth in ID. If it's, a, if it's a decurrent plant, and especially if it's a smaller decurrent plant, like maybe a red bud, that maybe you don't mind if it starts forking lower to the ground. There are some exceptions here, but especially for a shade tree, you're going to want a very strong central leader um, with evenly spaced, uh, decent sized branches. But again, you want that ratio to not to not be where those branches are getting to be competitive with the main stem. Look for mechanical damage always. Um, if it has trunk wrap on it, 
I would try to get that off, you know, ask if they'll remove it. So you can confirm that it doesn't have any, any scars or damage to it because I mean, I've damaged trees moving them. I know um, even the most careful and, you know, arborist with the best intentions, it, you know, it happens. Trees can be, especially with ball and burlap trees, it can be very difficult to move. And, you know, one mistake, you ding the trunk. If you can avoid buying a tree with mechanical damage, by all means do. You know, if it's a very small amount and it's otherwise a great tree, it might be worth uh, just accepting a little ding in the trunk. Uh, but you got to consider that that ding might might plague that tree for many years, actually. ANSI does have some good standards for, for nursery stock. Um, might not be a bad idea to print those out or pull them up on your phone or something and just kind of consult them, consult this list when you're at the nursery and just kind of run through a checklist. And, you know, if, if maybe one or two of these things is being slightly violated and, violated and otherwise it's a really great tree, um, again, you know, you maybe compromise a little bit, but, um, but you don't want to compromise too much. So included bark, I believe we talked about this with Mark Gruber a little bit, uh, but this branch is very likely to fail in the future. Um, it's also strongly upright. It's this branch to the side here is almost the same size as the central stem here. So it's going to need to be removed eventually, but uh, this is going to have a really hard time. This wound is going to have a really hard time compartmentalizing because of all this, this dead bark in there. So this would be, you wouldn't want to, to purchase this tree under any circumstances. Multiple leaders. This gets back to that very upright branch thing. You want a strong central leader. Now this can be corrected. Um, it's going to take some pruning. It really depends on how bad the uh, the competition between those leaders has got. This isn't a huge deal breaker. If it's if it's minor competition, it can easily be corrected at home, as long as you can reach them. Um, but if you can avoid it you're going to save yourself a little pruning. Die back of leaders with codominant stem. So this is, you know, this central dead stem and this one um, was the leader. It died back and now you have, you know, these two forking branches, which again is an ideal, um, you know, structurally this tree is just much weaker because now all this load is distributed on, on two branches that are coming off to the side. Um, they're much more likely to fail just because of the way um, the way weight and leverage is going to play onto those. That's why that strong central leader, um, you know, it's no different than a beam supporting your house. You want a straight beam coming up. You don't want to, you know, have two kind of forked off things like that. Healthy terminal bud and healthy buds in general. Um, typically, if you just kind of gently touch buds, if they're dead, they, they tend to break off pretty easily. So just look that they're um, you know, healthy and vigorous. Stem cankers, these can be caused by mechanical damage, but sometimes they're caused by insects or diseases too. So make a good inspection for those and make sure you're not buying a tree that has stem cankers. Multiple leaders again. Um, so, you know, if this was, like I said, you know, maybe a red bud or a, a cherry or something like that, that you, you want to turn into a big vase shaped tree that's going to take up a lot of space, but stay low to the ground and you're going to put a big mulch ring around it. That's not necessarily a big deal. Um, you know, if this, or like a Japanese maple, you know, a lot of people would look at that as a desirable feature for a Japanese maple. For a shade tree, this is terrible. You're going to have to remove two thirds of this tree in order to get it, uh, to get it a good habit. And that's, I mean, just think how much growth is put into those two thirds that you're just gonna to have to remove and how much time you're losing by removing those. Um, not ideal for the tree, it's not ideal for you. So look for fungus, insects, all those kinds of things on the stem. Um, wounds, this is possibly mechanical damage or possibly sun scald. You know, you don't wanna buy a tree with a large trunk wound like that. If it's if it's on a branch that you could prune off, again, if, if the rest of the tree is beautiful, 
might be worth making that uh, compromise. But a trunk wound like that is almost always gonna gonna plague that tree for the rest of its life and possibly lead to premature death. So the root flare, this is, if there's one thing that you remember from this entire presentation, please remember the root flare. Cause this is probably the number one preventable cause of tree death is trees being planted too deeply. So if you look at any large, healthy old tree in a landscape, you're gonna notice that it flares out at the base, out towards the ground. You will not see an old healthy tree that does not have a root flare because if it doesn't have a root flare, it will have died. Perhaps if there was a landslide or someone just came and did some severe construction and buried that tree, it's still gonna live for a few years with that root flare buried. That would be the rare exception. Um, you just never see it. Sometimes on certain evergreens, on certain pines, um, it doesn't form nearly this much, but for any deciduous tree, you're gonna see a very healthy sweep out at the bottom. Um, some people don't like it for some reason. They don't like those surface roots. You're gonna have to embrace it and look at it as an ornamental feature if you want a healthy tree. Um, so what happens when you bury the root flare is that a number of things. One, the rest of those roots are coming off of that root flare. And by burying the root flare, you're burying those roots too. You're making it harder for them to breathe. And as we've already discussed, roots really need oxygen. And the lower they are in the soil profile, the less oxygen they're gonna get. So you're kind of smothering the roots. And another thing that's likely to happen, that's probably going to happen, I say likely, but I would say it happens in probably 90, 7% of the cases I've ever seen is that if a tree is buried with its root flare under the soil level, it's going to develop adventitious roots. Uh, adventitious roots are very much like what happens when you take a cutting and you put it in water or soil and the, uh, the stem tissue starts to form roots. This is what trees do because they have undifferentiated tissue. And when that stem is exposed to soil, um, it gets this hormonal signal that you are no longer a stem. Now you're underground. Now we need to produce roots. This is information that's conveyed hormonally by the, uh, the presence of moisture, the lack of presence of light, things like that. And that stem will respond by forming roots. And this is what will happen if you bury a root flare. And those roots have a tendency to just circle the stem for whatever reason. I don't, I don't think that's understood at this point, but we know that it happens. It doesn't really matter why it happens, it does. And it's going to happen. Um, like I said, it's, you'll often hear people say it's, uh, it's likely to happen. And like I said, it is, you know, likely is one way of putting it, but in my experience, it's almost certain to happen. It's certainly not a gamble you want to take. Um, so make sure that you know where the root flare is, that it's exposed when you plant it and that you are planting it at the level of the soil or possibly slightly above. In most cases, I would aim for slightly above. And we'll discuss this again further down the road. Uh, but again, this really can't be repeated enough. I think I'm going to discuss it possibly two more times in this presentation. And I'm fine with that because you really need to remember this and understand it. No root flare here, just going straight down. Looks like a, um, like a utility pole just sunk into the ground. And then, you know, here you have some, uh, some, uh, some of the cord that they were using to, to stabilize that root ball that's probably going to girdle that tree. Ball and burlap planted too deep. So when you start to actually disassemble the root ball to find that root flare, sometimes you'll find that it's, uh, you know, if you look at that soil level where you can see the, the soil starting on that trunk and where that root flare actually is, it's extremely deep. Um, and not only not only is this bad for the tree, but consider that when you're buying a ball and burlap tree or any tree, you're buying uh, a root system. Again, people tend to not think of the root system as being an important part of the tree. It's really kind of the most important part of the tree. And that's a lot of what you're paying money for. Um, and here, you know, you've been ripped off. You've just been sold 
a bunch of a bunch of soil with no, no roots in it and now you have this tiny piddly little root system that's definitely not going to support uh that stem system above it so you know that's another reason why beyond just tree health um you know it's kind of like if you bought a 50 pound bag of rice and found you know it was mostly just full of full of soil or you know like a um i don't know what someone would adulterate a bag of rice with but the point is you're paying for a root system and you're just buying soil when you buy a tree that's planted too deep so using a i can't remember exactly what these pins are called but using a you know a long pin like this to find the root the uh the first roots that emerge from that root flare which are, are called the first order roots um can be a great way to to ensure that you're getting a good root system on a ball and burlap tree because you know with this tree you know the roots the root flare could be right underneath that burlap and it could all be great um but how are you going to know and uh you know the nursery is going to be very reluctant to remove this because it's going to be very difficult to get back in place so if you bring one of these along and you poke it down into the into the top of the root ball in a few different places before long you're probably going to hit one of those first order roots and it's going to give you a really good idea of uh how deep that root flare really is you know if it's only a couple inches down it's no big deal um even you know the best nurseries when they're digging ball and burlap trees if if you've never seen it done they use something called a tree spade which has it basically looks almost like the the carnival game where you have the the mechanical hand that comes down and picks up stuffed animals and then drops them and you never get one it looks kind of like that with a bunch of shovel blades and it will come down and dig the root ball out and lift it up. And um, when that happens, a certain amount of soil from the outside of that root ball tends to fall towards the center. And um, so it's not uncommon to get a, a ball and burlap tree, even from a very high quality nursery where the root flare might be um, one or two or even you know three inches below the soil level. And that soil has only been there for a short amount of time. The adventitious roots won't have had time to form. It's not an issue. But you want to make sure you know exactly where that is before you purchase a ball and burlap tree. And that's a great way to do it. Um, don't be fooled by graft unions. Um, it happens to the best of us. So a lot of trees, a lot of cultivated species are propagated asexually. They're propagated from cuttings from a parent plant. So they're all essentially clones of that plant. And that cutting is then taken and grafted onto just any old root system that they have sitting around. Um, all the root system is doing is, you know, the root system doesn't provide any aesthetic characteristics. So there's no point in propagating uh, a particular variety of root system. They typically just use, you know, some straight species rootstock. They graft the cultivar onto the top of it. And where that graft occurs, called the graft union, um, there's a tendency for a swelling to occur there as a scar tissue forms. And those two cambiums meet up and that graft union can actually very closely resemble a root flare. And sometimes if the soil level is piled up to just below that graft union, you look at it and you think, oh, great, it's got a, a nice root flare. And, uh, you know, then maybe, maybe you never figure that out until the tree dies or maybe um, as you're planting it, you know, some of that soil falls away and you realize that the actual root flare is a foot below soil level. Because um, typically that graft union is pretty high above the ground on the on the uh, the root stock it's being grafted to. So if you plant at that level, the root system is going to be very, very low into the ground. So be aware of that, um, especially on cultivars, as opposed to if you're just buying a straight species. All right, so now we're just going to get into the nuts and bolts of actually planting trees. relatively simple process as long as we just follow follow the basics so many stresses and physiological disorders can be traced to poor planting practices i've already talked this a little talked about this a little bit with the root flare um but a lot of it too is just poor selection um and the hole not being dug properly the root ball not being uh dealt with properly um right plant, right place. That's kind of what we just covered. Um, 
So think about the limitations of the site before you start planting. Um, so when to plant, this is always, uh, I think a lot of people think it's bizarre that you would go and plant a tree in the, in the middle of the winter, but you actually can't do it. The ideal time to do it is in fall, right after a leaf drop, before the ground is frozen. Um, you wanna do it when the ground is thawed or not frozen. Um, late fall, right after leaf drop is the ideal time because um, the soil is still going to be warm enough for those roots actually to start to grow a little bit that season and establish a little bit. Um, and then another thing you want is for, in addition to the roots, the soil of the root ball and the soil that you've planted the tree in, they need to kind of um, need to kind of sink up a little bit. You know, there's going to be some air pockets and things, things like that that are going to form during the planting process. And as those soils just kind of naturally settle and as they go through freeze and thaw cycles and as they become saturated and dry, those soils are going to kind of blend together and it's uh, going to make it easier for the roots to mer emerge from the root ball and actually start finding their way through that soil. If they encounter air pockets, for example, um, they're going to dry up and die there and they're not going to be able to grow through those air pockets. So that's another good time to do it. Um, spring is also a great time right now. Great time to plant trees. Um, ideally, you don't want to do it when they've started to leaf out. Um, if the buds are just starting to swell, it's still fine. But especially if they're in the process of leafing out, that's a terrible time to do anything to a tree um, because they're just kind of waking up and they're using a lot of stored energy to open up and create those new leaves. And um, when you plant a tree, you're actually asking it to use up some of its stored energy to adapt to its new site. And you don't want to do that when it's already really tapping into those energy reserves. And like I said, the winter can be a perfectly fine time to plant trees, provided that the ground isn't frozen. Um, and that, you know, it's, you're not going to get a hard freeze real soon. Um, I would prefer to plant in the winter and in fact have done more times than I can count as opposed to planting in the middle of the summer because that's uh, just an extremely stressful time for especially deciduous trees and it's going to require you to water them much much more. Maintaining enough moisture always crucial. Um, so when when you plant in the in the fall another great thing about this is because the trees don't have leaves if we remember from our biology intro, um, water is always kind of moving through the tree, through the roots up and out of those leaves through transpiration. And when the leaves, are, when the leaves aren't present, that transpiration slows down. It, it's almost not happening. You know, there's a certain degree of it happening. It, you know, a tree will lose a certain amount of moisture through lenticels and things like that, but, uh, but not a lot. So that's why um, you're not going to have to water as vigorously when you plant a tree in the fall. You know, you can pretty much, you know, you can water it in maybe once a week for the first few weeks and, uh, and then pretty much just leave it go until, until spring when it starts to leaf out. Whereas in the summer, it's immediately transpiring. You're going to need to start pumping water through that thing. And then in spring, it's great because typically, um, you know, the weather's just going to kind of water it in for you. So we have three main types of planting stock, bare root. Um, this is probably going to be the one you're going to encounter the least. If you do, it's probably going to be the little seedlings you're going to get from like the state nursery, something like that. Um, containerized, probably the easiest for the homeowner to deal with. Um, it's what we offer at the nursery. Uh, containerized are very easy to transport and very easy to grow. Ball and burlap, um, you're going to see that more um, in, in the landscaping industry and the, the arboriculture industry. Um, so according to studies, the most, the best type of planting stock is if you can get a bald and burlap tree that has been root pruned in the field, which means someone has come along with a spade of some kind once a year and dug a trench around that tree at the distance that that root ball is going to be cut in the future when the tree is dug. This doesn't really happen very often at nurseries. The, you know, that's the ideal, but um, like I said, I, I don't know of a nursery that actually does that. 
but studies have been done that that those trees have the best survival rate of any type. Um, we'll talk about some more of the advantages here. They all have their own advantages and drawbacks. Um, and another thing to consider that bare root trees make really clear is just what kind of root system the tree has. Um, a lot of our most popular nursery trees have a very fibrous root system. Green ash is the example here. Obviously, we're not, we're not planting any of those anymore, but red maple is another one that has an extremely fibrous root system. And part of the reason red maples are so popular, um, besides the fact that they are beautiful trees, is that they're so easy to grow because they have such a fibrous root system. And so the nursery industry loves them. They love pushing them because it's, it's easy for them to make money on. Whereas, you know, we have a black walnut on the left there. Um, very coarse root system. Um, if you, you know, if you imagine disturbing these root systems, you can imagine which one's easier to, to damage that one on the left, actually, you know, the fibrous roots, even if you rip some of them, um, because they're so much smaller, they're going to recover more easily. And also they're going to be a little more pliable. Whereas you have that really woody coarse root system, you know, if we really wanted to, we could probably count how many roots there are there and you could easily break, you know, 10% of them. And um, then if you consider how much of the root system is going to be damaged just by the act of digging it out of the ground and planting it, um, you're really losing a lot of roots. And another thing to consider is a tap root. Trees that are, uh, trees that have tap roots tend to be really hard to transplant. This is why it's almost impossible to buy a hickory in the landscape trade because uh, hickories are very difficult to grow because their root system tends to be just like a giant carrot. And it's really easy to break. If you break that, the tree is pretty much, pretty much done for. So what's great about bare root trees is they're small, they're easy to transplant. Um, the weight of a container tree or a ball and burlap tree is you know, it's almost all just the soil weight. The tree itself weighs very, very little. Um, so that's why these things are so light. Um, you need to keep the roots moist, um, like very diligently. You can't let them dry out at all or they're gonna start to die. Um, the state nursery sprays them down with, they have some sort of like uh, water holding gel and then they wrap them in, uh, in like newspaper or cloth or something. Um, you can only plant these during the dormant season which ideally you should only be planting anything during the dormant season. And you're going to want to form a little, a little mound here. They, I'll get to that in a second, but these, they are more likely to require staking um, again, because there's just no, uh, no weight structure down at the bottom to hold them in place. And you are going to have to store them in a cool area. So if you get these, you're pretty much going to want to plant them like immediately unless you have a, you know, walk-in freezer, or if you're just planting a few of them, keep them in a cooler on ice or something with the beers you're going to drink when you're done planting. Um, so here, you know, they kind of give a demonstration. You're going to form a little, a little mound of soil in here for the tree to set on, and then you're going to let the roots spread out around it. You know, if you have a tap root, you might make a little hole down the middle and put it in there and just, you know, kind of form that soil to it. So plant them on small compact mounds and holes. Make sure to keep that root system wet. That's kind of the main thing with, uh, with bare root and be prepared to, to probably stake them. So containerized, can be planted any time of the year. Shouldn't be, can be. Um, easy to store and handle. It's, it's really easy to, to just slide those pots around. Uh, ball and burlap trees, I'll talk about it a little more, but they're just kind of a nightmare to move, especially once they get to a decent size. Um, you can get containerized trees in all sorts of sizes from the little, I don't know if that's like quart containers that you might get from like the Arbor Day Foundation or something, um, to 25 gallon is probably the largest I've ever planted, but I've seen pictures of even larger ones where, uh, you know, it almost looks like, you know, I saw one from some crazy planting project that was being done in California, where it almost looked like one of those uh, little above ground pools that, uh, you know, you, you might have your kids playing in, in your backyard. So uh, kind of any size you want. Uh, less plant, tra less plant transplant shock with a question mark. 
it's less it's not so much as a, a matter of in my opinion less than it's different transplant shock um with a ball and burlap tree you're taking a tree that's grown in soil and you're putting it in soil and if it's from a similar soil type you know if you get it from a nursery in missouri there's not going to be a huge difference in that soil type um so that's where you're going to get kind of a lessened transplant shock with a ball and burlap tree with a ball and burlap tree the transplant shock comes from the fact that you're removing a much of the root system when you when you dig it whereas a containerized tree you're losing much less of the root system in some cases you might not be losing any of it but it's going from growing in a nice media that was designed by humans to be ideal for root growth to being in, you know, whatever junk compacted clay soil it's going to wind up in. So that's a different type of transplant shock. But um, as far as root system loss, there's going to be less root system loss. Um, it's just kind of apples to oranges. There's two different kinds of transplant shock really going on. Girdling roots, I don't know if they're necessarily a worse problem in containerized trees than, uh, than ball and burlap trees. They tend to form for different reasons. Um, and they are, they are quite common. So this is why you're typically gonna find circling roots in a container. So as containerized trees are go through their life, you know, they typically move up pot sizes as they grow. You know, most nurseries aren't going to plant them all in 25 gallon pots and let them sit there for years until they get big enough to sell because those pots are taking up space. It's just a waste of money. They're going to grow them in smaller pots and they're going to move them up to bigger and bigger pots. And as that happens, a lot of times soil will get piled up around the root flare. And then once it meets its final pot, the pot that it gets sold in. Sometimes it might sit there for longer than is ideal. And it's going to start to, when those roots hit the edge of the pot, they need to keep growing, but they can't grow outwards, obviously, because the pot's preventing them from doing it. So they're just going to start growing in circles. And uh, once this happens, it's very hard for the roots to break this habit. And if this happens to roots that are growing above the level of the root flare, um, then they're going to start to encircle the main stem. And this can cause girdling roots. And girdling roots, as I said uh, previously, it's possibly the largest, uh, largest cause of premature tree death in our landscapes. As the tree gets bigger every year, and that root gets bigger every year, and the root just keeps circling the, the main trunk, and the trunk keeps getting bigger, eventually the two are going to meet and they're gonna just both keep growing. And eventually that root is going to choke off the cambium, choke off the vascular tissue of that main trunk and kill it. And typically this happens around 20 years after the tree, not necessarily when it, when it was planted, but when it's about 20 years old which also happens to be right around when it starts to look like a tree and you have it in your landscape and you're really starting to get excited about it and your kids can start climbing it and it's starting to actually cast some nice shade and then all of a sudden it starts looking kind of peaked and the leaves are un undeveloped and uh, you start to do some rooting around and uh, you find that it's being girdled. And um, we'll look at some slides of girdling roots, but um, they, it's not necessarily something that can't be corrected, uh, but it often cannot. And like I said, typically it's, it's gonna become a problem when that tree's, when you've wasted so many years caring for that tree and now um, you might have to remove it. So it's very important that with a containerized tree, you break this circling habit of the roots. So this is where roughing up the root flare comes into play. There are various ways to do this and there are various degrees of intensity needed depending on uh, how bad the circling habit has become, how root bound the tree is. Um, but typically you're gonna wanna cut through some of those roots somehow. Um, it may seem extreme that you're 
you're damaging the roots, but it's better than the alternative of leaving them like that. Because when you put them in the ground and they have that circling habit, as I said, they're, they're not gonna break that habit. They've been trained into it and they're just gonna keep circling and circling. And they're never really gonna, they're never really gonna reach out into the native soil around them and establish that tree. So um, if the tree isn't particularly root bound, a lot of times this can be accomplished with nothing more than your hands. Um, you know, you're probably gonna wanna wear gloves to it, but um, you might not, you know, if you don't mind getting your, your fingernails real dirty and you just kind of scratch that root ball up with your fingers. Um, it's typically not gonna be that easy. You're usually gonna wanna use maybe like a trowel or um, a soil knife if you have one. It's one of the best tools you can invest in if you're into working in your yard and gardening by a soil knife um, with a serrated back blade. And um, kind of rough it up with that. You know, here they show some, some angular cuts just made down the side. That can be a great thing to do, just make some slits on all four sides of it. If there's some really large woody roots in there, you know, they're getting maybe the size of a pencil or larger, I would cut those with a pair of pruners. Um, I would cut like an inch out of it so it can't just fuse back together. Don't just cut it once because typically it's going to realign and there's a good chance that those that it could kind of regraft itself. And then there's another process called boxing, which I've used on all sorts of trees. Um, Gary Johnson of the University of Minnesota actually invented this technique and he studied it and um, he's, he's shown it to be very effective. And um, even though it may seem extreme, it's actually got scientific backing to it. So I'm a big fan of boxing trees. Um, and it's a very simple process to describe. You take a, um, you take a saw, one that you're not real attached to the blade on because you're gonna you're gonna mess the teeth up by doing this by cutting through soil, but you're gonna take a pruning saw or some kind of saw um, and you're gonna cut an inch into the side of the root ball on four sides so that the result goes from being a round root ball pulled out of your round container, presumably, to kind of a square one. And um, on, you know, you're gonna take off an inch on each side to form that, to form that square. And that's going to be a really effective way to do this. And it's also very, it kind of, I'm going to say it cuts through, no pun intended, but it cuts through a lot of the confusion about what's the best way to rough up a root ball. Um, it's just a very straightforward systematic process. And then you're left with, um, with a root system that's kind of forced to grow out into the soil. So bald and burlap. Um, Widely available, easy to find, um, used to be more common. I don't know if that's necessarily the case anymore. Kind of depends on where you're looking. Um, heavy and hard to handle. That's that's the main drawback with these. And because of the way they're dug, they, that root ball tends to be shaped kind of like a top to where, uh, you know, you can't just easily, you know, the, the tree is going to be sitting at an angle because the, the root ball is cut in kind of a V shape. Um, so it's, they're, they're tricky to move. You almost always need, uh, some sort of like, like hay hooks or, a, a ball cart or some carrying straps to transport them. Um, if it's big enough, you're almost certainly going to want at least one other person to help you. So much of the root system is lost during digging. In best case scenario, you're going to lose 40%. You know, here we say as much as 95%, depending on the size of the root ball and the tree and all that. Um, so that's not great, but at the same time, like I said earlier, um, the shock from the different soil types that the roots were used to growing into the new soil is lessened. So that's, um, th that's a benefit of ball and burlap trees. And they're also not going to dry out as fast because one of the, one of the things that potting media is designed to do is drain well. Um, so it can be watered frequently. And so the roots will develop more vigorously, whereas ball and burlap trees being grown in actual soil, that soil is going to hold moisture more effectively. Um, so they can kind of sit around for a little bit longer with less care. 
Not that you should do that, but it happens. So the burlap basically supports that root ball and holds all that soil that the root system is growing through. Um, synthetic burlap will decompose slower. The classic way to test if it's uh, synthetic or not is to burn it. Um, it'll melt if it's synthetic, whereas if it's actual um, organic burlap, it'll burn. Um, even if it's a little moist, if you hold a lighter to it for long enough, you're going you're gonna to start to be able to tell the difference. Um, from a wicking of water away from the root ball. Um, so if you leave it in there, you know, especially with uh, the upper part of the burlap, that, you know, it can wick water up out of the ground into that upper burlap where it's not really doing any good for the tree. And just to let me go back here, one of the trickiest things about fallen burlap trees is you, unless you're really familiar with the nursery you're getting them from, you never really know what's inside of that burlap ball. Um, with a container grown tree, you pretty much always know, you know, container media, it does vary a little bit from place to place, but it's always, it's always kind of similar. Um, the amount of root that's going to be in there, you're never really that sure of, but um, you can always just slide a uh, container grown tree out of the pot and take a look at that. Um, if you do that and the whole thing falls apart, then you shouldn't have been buying that tree. The nursery really shouldn't have been selling it either. And if it's just totally root bound, it'll happen extremely easily and no soil whatsoever will fall off. With a ball and burlap tree, it can be just all over the place. And even from the same nursery, you know, they're, they're probably going to have some topographical variations and they're going to have some soil that's more sandy and some that's more clay. Um, sometimes you open that, you could remove that burlap and, uh, and the root ball just, just sits there because it's clay, you know, it's like a, you know, you could put it in an oven fire and it would just turn into a giant hard ball of rock whereas sometimes you open it up and it just disintegrates because it's so sandy and part of that also depends on you know if you have a more fibrous root system it's going to hold that ball together better so again it's good to kind of know what sort of root system you're dealing with um, but that makes planting ball and burlap trees a lot trickier and um, why typically with a ball and burlap tree you want to dig the hole get the tree into the hole and then start removing first the wire cage. You cut that off um, around all the sides of the tree. You don't have to worry about underneath the tree so much. Um, you're almost always gonna have to leave um, maybe part of the cage and almost always a certain amount of the burlap under the tree. But again, the roots aren't really doing a whole lot directly under the tree. They're, you're more worried about them spreading outwards as we'll see in a in a picture later on. So with a ball and burlap tree, you're typically just going to put it in the hole um, complete and then take it apart because you never really know what's going to happen to that root ball. So always cover trees when you're transplanting them. I don't care what time of the year it is. I don't care how slow you're going to drive. Um, unless you're prepared to drive like five miles an hour from where you bought that tree back to your house, um, you're going to be shocking that tree with the amount of wind exposure it gets. Uh, 30 miles an hour is not a fast car drive, but it's, uh, you know, in a windstorm that would be considered pretty heavy winds. And that is the kind of wind that would desiccate a tree. So cover it with a tarp. Don't leave it covered too much longer when you get to wherever you're going, especially on a hot sunny day. Um, just think about what would happen under a tarp on a hot sunny day. It's going to get nasty and humid in there. Um, and that can start to lead, lead to some fungus and insects and stuff being, uh, you know, breeding. And always avoid moving a tree by its trunk. Um, if you know you have a really, really strong, vigorous root system and you maybe just have to use the trunk just the slightest bit to kind of adjust what you're doing, I'm not going to say that, um, you know, my hands don't occasionally touch the trunk and you're not going to see people doing it, but you really want to just avoid jerking that trunk because the, the danger is you're going to break some of those first order roots and it's really easy to do. Um, and then, you know, there's typically only, you know, at most maybe five to seven first order roots. 
if you break one of those, you're, you know, this tree is already lost at best 40%. Let's say you break another one of those first order roots, that's another 20% of that 60% root system. Um, so it's, it's just not worth messing with. Use hay hooks, dollies, ball slings, carts, all these kinds of things. Have someone help you do it. Um, don't just try to muscle it yourself and, and risk breaking that tree that, you know, for a nice ball and burlap tree, you almost certainly paid at least a hundred dollars for it. So actually digging the hole. So first things first, you want to think about where you're going to put the dirt when you get it out of the hole. Because a lot of people start digging and it just winds up everywhere. You know, they start throwing it over their shoulder or whatever. Um, you don't want to do more work than you need to do. And you're also going to need some of that soil to backfill because your hole is going to be twice the size of a root ball. Um, in some cases, you're probably going to wind up using almost all the soil to backfill. So you're going to want to put it all in a nice neat pile right next to the hole. So it'll be really easy for you to backfill. Or if it's a really big hole, you know, maybe a, a couple piles. If it's a really huge hole, maybe four piles, but you, you want to be clean and systematic about it. The best way to do it, if you can, is to get a tarp and set it there and just pile it on the tarp. And then you can, not only can you use the tarp to kind of um, pick it up and dump it back into the hole, but then you're going to keep your grass clean or your mulch bed if you're planting in the bed or something like that. So you don't want it to be deeper than the root ball. You don't want to backfill at all underneath where the tree is going. And I would, this picture shows a tree still in its container. I would get it out of container and confirm not only where that root flare is, but also in almost every case, when you take a tree out of a container, the very bottom of that container doesn't have a lot of roots in it. Um, what happens, so soil is basically like a sponge. This, this root ball is like a sponge. As it gets watered, um, some of that water is, is always gonna kind of remain in the bottom of that pot, even with drain holes, um, just by, by that capillary action, that sponge-like property, um, the very bottom of that root ball is going to stay pretty wet and it's not going to have a lot of roots in it unless the tree's been sitting in that pot for a really long time and is really root bound. So you're, the tree you're going you're gonna to get out of there is probably going to be a little shorter than that, that container would have you believe. So get it out and confirm it, actually how deep it's going to need to be. You know, I typically just use the blade of the shovel I'm using or the handle um, if the blade isn't long enough and only dig it that deep for two reasons. One, do you want to do more digging than is necessary? Probably not, unless you're just really looking for a workout. And if you are, do something else. Because the other reason is that if you backfill with, if you have to backfill underneath the tree, um, that soil is going to be looser than it originally was. And the tree is going to wind up settling on it. And then when you plant your root flare at, you know, nice, perfectly at grade and that tree settles, it's all of a sudden not going to be above grade anymore. And then you're going to get all, all the issues we talked about with the tree being planted too deep. Remove the existing grass. Don't put that back in the hole. Um, that's going to cause a variety of issues. Um, cut the sod layer off, discard it. Um, and scratch the sides of the hole if it winds up being glazed. This is fairly common with clay soil, um, just where that shovel slides in. You know, if the sides look all slick and smooth, just kind of rough them up a little bit because that glazed side is going to be hard for the roots to penetrate through. Again, don't use the trunk to move the tree, just use the container. Now, getting the tree out of the container can be tricky. Um, sometimes you're just gonna have to cut the container off. If you, so I would say the one caveat to handling the tree by the trunk is that if you're gently pulling straight up, your odds of breaking those first order roots are pretty slim. So typically what I do is lay the tree on its side and holding the trunk, just kind of try to slide the, uh, the container off of it and that typically involves pulling the tree a little bit out too. Um, but again, you're pulling straight away from it. You're not, you're not torquing that root ball back and forth where you're going to break those, uh, 
break those first order roots. Remove any twine, any sort of tags, anything like that. Um, that stuff can wind up growing it. You know, the tree can grow over that stuff. Um, I, I don't know how many times I've seen a tag that is actually, you know, has tree tissue grown around it to where at this point, all you can do is cut the sides of the tag and let the tree grow around it and hope for the best. Um, certainly any twine around the, around the base of the tree can easily girdle the tree and kill it. By that same mechanism that the roots can girdle it, the tree keeps getting bigger and bigger, that twine stays wrapped around it and eventually it just chokes it off. Um, and encircling roots, as we talked about, preparing your root ball, maybe box it or cut those roots with, with some pruners. Make sure that it's at grade. You know, this is a, a great way to do that if you have a, a very straight board. Um, a shovel handle can work well. I mean, I typically just eyeball it and go for having it just a little bit above grade. I would always have a, I would always prefer to have it a little higher. Um, never had problems with that. And again, the root flare. Um, make sure that you know where the root flare is, that it's exposed and that it's right at grade or a little bit above grade. When you find that root flare, inspect for girdling roots too and remove them right away. There's never really any point to, to waiting to remove a girdling root unless um, if there's several of them and this is a tree that, you know, it's already been planted that you're managing and you need to, uh, to phase them out, you know, that might be a case where you, you know, you remove the worst one and then do the rest of them in kind of a process. Or, um, I might consider if it was a, if it was an oak and it was, um, during oak wilt season, maybe putting off removing it. But if you're about to plant a tree and you find a girdling root, just go ahead and cut it right away before it becomes a problem. Planting depth, again, this can't, this can't be stressed enough. It, the tree really needs to be planted at proper depth with the root flare, slightly above grade. And in heavy clay soils, um, they should be planted shallowly. That root ball should in fact be a little bit higher, three to five inches maybe, depending on, on how poorly drained that clay is. Because when you put that uh, when you put that tree in there, water is gonna gonna stay around the root ball because it doesn't drain as well, and you're giving the tree a little bit more room to breathe by keeping it out of there. Rooting gravel in the bottom of a hole accomplishes nothing, um, and in fact, it can lead to a perched water table. So previously, when I was talking about how a root ball is um, like a sponge, you know, if you take a sponge that's saturated with water and you set it on top of another sponge, the second sponge will actually start to absorb some of that water. If you take a sponge that's saturated with water and just hold it, it holds that water. That's what it does. It's a sponge. That's why we like sponges. Um, the same thing will happen if you set that, uh, that root ball on top of gravel, that, that change in, uh, in density in the material properties is going to cause that sponge like characteristic to just hold the water in that root ball. Whereas if there's a, there's soil underneath it to kind of wick that moisture out of the root ball, then it's going to drain properly. So people tell you that putting gravel in the bottom might be a good way to promote drainage when in fact, it's likely to do the opposite. So just don't do it. And soft fill should not be used in the bottom again because the tree will sink. So you're gonna wanna measure the root ball again. Like I said, make sure you know where the root flare is. Um, with a ball and burlap tree, the whole bottom falling apart isn't an issue because you're just gonna put it into the hole intact like that and then just remove this stuff. So the height isn't gonna change. But like I said, with the uh, with a container grown tree, take it out of the container. Um, like I said, I could almost guarantee you, you're gonna lose like an inch or two off the bottom of it when you do that. And that's your planting depth. That's how deep you're gonna dig your hole. And so this demonstrates why you're gonna to wanna to plant in a heavy clay soil, kind of uh, higher up, just to give it this extra drainage area up here and let those upper roots breathe a little bit more. 
And so with a ball and burlap tree, there's a little, a little graphic here demonstrating that how you're gonna cut the burlap off the top, you're gonna pull it down. Um, this hole should probably be a little bit bigger so you can actually reach down in there, cut all that stuff away and pull it away. And you know you can leave this little bit on the bottom, get the cage out of there too, um, cut away the upper one third of the wire. As they say here, you know, again, down around the bottom here, almost all the root action is gonna be happening above that. So, uh, so don't worry about removing it from the bottom because if you do, the, the root ball is likely to fall apart. And this just demonstrates again, how those roots are actually gonna grow out of the root ball. Most of it's gonna happen further up. So when you're done, you have your nice little soil piles around your planting hole. Hopefully it's sitting on a tarp or something like that. You can just backfill, gently pack it in. You don't want to compact the compact the life out of it and just crush it. But you know, you wanna you wanna firm it down. And uh, a good way to do that is to just moisten it and let the water and the gravity of that water kind of settle it all down. Maybe just gently firm it with your hands. Don't amend the soil. Um, that kind of gives the roots a false sense of what kind of environment they've just been put in. If you dig this, uh, you know, this hole twice the size of the root ball and you backfill it with all sorts of nice compost or even worse, uh, fertilizer, then those roots, you know, start to emerge from the root ball and it's, you know, they're in Xanadu. They're in this wonderful, fluffy, nutrient rich environment. And for, you know, a couple of years, they're growing through that and then boom, they hit that compacted, nasty clay that, you know, that is going to be their home for the next, you know, ideally 100 years. And it's going to be a, it's going to be a rude awakening. You're better off just having those roots adapt to that immediately, because otherwise, you're just going to get kind of this false flush of growth to begin with. And then the tree is going to get really stressed out all of a sudden. You're better off just having all that stress take place in one event and let the tree deal with that. Um, and another, another thing that that uh, those amendments and particularly fertilizer can do is encourage the tree to push a bunch of top growth. Um, I heard, I can't remember who I heard say this, but don't make the shoots write a check, the roots can't cash. There needs to be a, a natural balance between the root system and the shoots and the roots are essentially going to tell the shoots how much to grow by how much how much nutrients they can they can send up there's going to be again hormonal signaling between the different parts of the tree to uh to determine how much the top of the tree should grow and when it gets that big flush of nutrients you're going to get a big flush of top growth but the roots aren't actually going to be able to sustain that because um they're going to get over optimistic you know in a sense they're going to put on all that all that growth because there's all this nitrogen available then when they hit that hit that outer layer and the roots really stop growing all of a sudden they they've kind of invested too much into the shoots and it's it's playing with this uh this balance between the shoots and the roots you know this is the reason why you'll see uh something like a post oak that can get to be extremely tall you know easily 100 feet tall um you might see one growing on the top of a little knob down in the Ozarks that's 200 years old and it's you know 15 feet tall and it's just a gnarly little bonsai tree. Um, you see the same thing with eastern red cedar all the time, growing out of the face of a cliff along the highway. Or again, you know, at, um, out in the country, you'll see them, you know, on these knob tops, and they can be really, really quite old, and they've only reached a tiny percentage of their genetic potential for growth because. Um, their root system is saying, hey, this is kind of all we've got. And they'll sit there content for that. That's why, uh, you know, the art of bonsai can be performed because you're you're playing with that balance and you're actually going in and pruning the roots to control. Um, you know, there's more to it than that, but that's an aspect of it. Um, so you need to maintain that natural balance. And part of the way to do that from the get-go is to just let that root system adapt to the environment it's going to be growing in. Saturate the hole with water, add more soil if needed. 
get that grade established, then you're gonna to wanna to put three inches of mulch down, not against the trunk. Again, this is super important. Um, mulch eventually does just become soil. It breaks down. And if it's piled up against the trunk, um, you'll get all the same problems that have come with planting a tree too deep. And in the shorter term, it's also gonna hold a lot of moisture against the trunk and can encourage um, fungus can encourage bugs to grow um, and you know to start feeding on that trunk and things like that and then you get um when you when you remove all that mulch you know if you catch if this has happened and you're trying to correct the situation you pull all that mulch back then you have this trunk that uh that isn't really adapted to the air and the sunlight of uh you know that it should have been adapting to so that can be a shock to um you still would want to go ahead and do it. I'm not saying don't pull all that mulch back, but um, ideally just don't ever let it happen in the first place. You want to keep maybe about a six inch ring. Again, depending on the size of the tree and the first order roots, um, but you're going to want that root flare to, flare to be completely exposed and leave a ring around the outside that's just bare ground. You know, if you can't stand the way that looks and you really need that mulch color in there, just take a little bit of mulch and, you know, sprinkle it like, a, you know, like you're very lightly applying salt to a, to a meal or something just to get a little bit of color at most, but don't have any appreciable amount of mulch actually touching the trunk it leads to all sorts of problems. Staking should be avoided unless it's absolutely necessary. Um, if you do need to stake, you really need to be careful to come back and move the stakes periodically. You know, this is a good example of improperly staked tree that hasn't been checked on. Um, old hose is kind of a, a standby for staking because, you know, most landscaping companies and, you know, parks departments and places like that have all sorts of this old junk hose. You know, when a hose gets ruined, maybe it gets hit by a lawnmower, you take it and set it aside for tree staking. There's also some really nice uh, webbing products you can use. And those are nice because they're a little more, bit more breathable, whereas hose is uh, completely unbreathable and will hold moisture against the trunk. Uh, but regardless, you should move it as frequently as you can, um, depending on how heavily the, the tree needs to be staked and how often you're visiting that tree. You know, if you can just shift it like an inch, maybe even every time you water it, that's ideal. At the very least, every uh, every growing season, it needs to be moved. Don't just do it because, you know, you, you, you think you should, you know, maybe there's a little bit of a crook in the tree that's probably in time just gonna correct itself. Um, trees tend to grow, you know, pretty well straight up just because of the sun. Um, a lot of those minor bows and things will correct themselves and don't really need any of your help. And, um, you know, as far as wind, trees are really good at adapting to wind. So unless you feel like the tree, unless the tree is just really unstable, you know, maybe the root ball kind of fell apart when you were planting it or something. Um, it's, it's, it's very rarely necessary. I would say of all the trees I've planted, which is more than I could possibly count, maybe like five to 10% I needed to, to stake. And those are almost all ball and burlap trees that just had kind of a lousy root ball and started to fall apart when I was, when I was planting them. And you have different methods depending on the size of the tree. You know, a small tree, you can typically get away with one and then as you get bigger, you might have to go with this kind of guy wire thing where you're making a tripod around it. It's important that there be a little bit of play in these. Um, the tree should be able to move a little bit from side to side. It shouldn't be just held rigidly in place. Um, not only is that going to be bad for the trunk, just having something against it that tight, um, start to do some minor girdling there but it also doesn't allow the tree to get that natural sway from the wind that's gonna strengthen its root system. Um, you know, that's almost like exercise for the root system, having it being pulled from side to side. That stress is gonna, again, send hormonal signals that that tree needs to put on more wood in certain directions. That's why 
um, you know, we talked about with Mark Gruber a little bit, if a tree's maybe got to lean on a hill or if there's prevailing wind from one direction, that tree's going to respond by putting on growth um, preferentially in the direction of the stress to kind of buffer against that. And you want that to happen. You want that tree to adapt to its environment. And the stakes are, uh, it's kind of like leaving training wheels on your kid's bike for too long. You need to take them off eventually and uh, you need to let it, you know, actually adapt to the, to the situation, the reality of the situation it's in should be avoided if possible. There are cases where, um, you know, vandalism, or it might be an area where say maybe the people that are going to be mowing the grass around it aren't the most careful um, where you might want to put stakes up really just to form a physical barrier around that tree. Um, not really ideal, but you know, sometimes that's just the reality of it. Don't drive those stakes to the root ball. They need to be out in the, in the soil around the tree so they can really firmly anchor it, allow for flexibility so the tree can move. Um, larger trees, this is going to be more of an issue with like really kind of oversized plantings greater than four inches. There's just really no call to plant trees that size in most cases. Um, it's usually, in my opinion, done for vanity, for architectural vanity. You're typically going to see it around, uh, you know, new businesses or, you know, someone who kind of has more money than they know what to do with. And they just insist on having, having a really large tree. Removed after one growing season whenever possible. Sometimes in extreme cases, you might need to leave them on for longer. But again, just be really diligent about checking up on them. So watering is really the most important thing that you need to do. Um, there's really no two ways around it unless you're unlucky enough to have just constant rain for three years straight after you plant a tree. Um, you want the soil to be moist but not wet. You don't want to just totally waterlog it, but you want to get it very wet. You know, you want to be able to, the easiest thing to do, like, uh, like Hank Stelzer was saying, is just stick your finger in the ground. You know, if you can get down um, an inch or two and it's wet down there, after you've, after you've watered, you've, you've probably done a pretty decent job saturating it. Uh, about once a week typically is fine. If we get extreme drought conditions, if we get another summer of 2012, you might have to do three times a week. But you want that soil to dry out completely between waterings, like I was saying. Um, if it rains enough, don't water, just go out and check on that. Um, it's usually pretty easy to figure out if it's been raining enough. If you planted a tree recently, I think you're good to, to skip watering for a while. Um, mulch, another hugely important thing for all sorts of reasons. It, it helps retain moisture in the soil by forming a, a layer over a top that prevents evaporation. It prevents grass and weeds to an extent, um, reduces soil temperature and um, it's nice, it, it kind of keeps the soil cool in the summer and keeps it a little bit warmer in the winter. So it buffers it against those extreme changes. It does break down over time and adds organic matter. Keeps mowers away from the tree, which is huge. Um, I would say once a tree is in the ground, it's been properly planted, the biggest preventable cause of death is being hit by lawn mowers or line trimmers, you know, almost I mean, that gets back into those 90% territories of, you know, trees that I've had to remove prematurely from a landscape that weren't killed by, you know, there are acts of God always, a tree can get struck by lightning, um, a storm could damage it, something like that. But as far as just, you know, human malfeasance that can be prevented, just being hit by a lawnmower or a line trimmer, that's almost always why that tree just prematurely died. Um, this is not enough mulch. The mulch should really extend out to the to the drip line, you know, as far out as the branches reach. This is that volcano mulching that we all see all over the place. It's kind of the industry standard. I don't know how it got that way, but it's terrible for trees. Take this same amount of mulch and just make a bigger mulch ring with it would be my solution to that if you really want to sell mulch. It's kind of awesome when you see huge mulch rings like this, you know, it's not ideal for all of us, but um. But that's really, you know, the, 
the best thing, like I said, at least to the drip line, maybe a little bit further. That way you're not gonna have to worry about clearance pruning or anything the first few years. You can just let the, let the, tree, uh, let the tree grow. And then as it gets taller and you can maybe start to phase out some of those lower branches, you can bring the mulching in a little bit, kind of depending on where it is in your landscape and what you're trying to do with it. So fertilization is not recommended. I've already addressed that. Pruning immediately after planting should only be done if there's disease, dead, dying, or damaged branches. Don't try to do any corrective structural pruning. Don't remove any healthy live tissue right after planting. Ideally wait three years. Um, there are a couple exceptions to that that I'll discuss later, but most trees you're gonna wanna let them have all the energy they can for the first few years. Trunk wrap, not recommended. Um, again, if, you're, if you think that your options are either using some sort of trunk wrap or trunk protector or the tree is gonna get hit with a line trimmer, go ahead and use the trunk wrap. Um, I've used it many, many times because the, the knock against trunk wrap and any sort of trunk protector is kind of similar to the situation with mulch that you're holding moisture against the trunk. You're preventing the trunk from adapting to sunlight, which is particularly important for uh, thin species trees like maple or linden that are um, subject to sun scald. But, you know, I always say a tree can adapt to those things. A tree can never adapt to being hit by a lawnmower or a line trimmer. That in almost every case kills the tree. Whereas uh, even sun scald isn't typically lethal. So sometimes it's uh, it's just the lesser of two evils. But if you don't need to use it, you know, if you're planting this tree in your yard and you're the one mowing or you're paying someone to mow it um, and you know, you can go out and tell them, hey, don't hit this tree. And if you do, I'm gonna fire you. Um, you know, it's typically not, this is typically something you're going to use in like park settings. So one year for inch of caliper is a is good kind of general rule for how long it's going to take to establish, which again is why if, you know, you want to do those vanity plantings where you drop a thousand dollars on like a seven inch tree and plant it in your front yard, um, it's gonna cost you so much more than that thousand dollars because for seven years, you're gonna be babying that thing. Whereas if you plant one of our little half inch to one inch, three gallon trees, um, you know, you'd still ideally wanna water it for the first three years, but you could probably get away with only doing it for one year because the transplant shock is so minor and, uh, and it just needs so much less water. So this is why site selection is so important. Um, you know, planting just huge uh, monstrous trees right next to buildings, right next to driveways, um, not a great idea. And if you do, you're just gonna have to manage them so much. Um, some of these little areas that a lot of municipalities used to, some still do provide for trees to grow in, um, just aren't suitable. You know, tree pits where it's a, a little three by three by maybe three feet deep hole with no sort of drainage. Um, you just can't plant anything there. A, a tree lawn more narrow than three feet. Three feet is even, it's not ideal, but there are species you can put in there, but little two foot tree lawns, um, you just can't put a tree there, you know? And I think you'd be better off using uh, maybe just some, you know, some native perennials, do a little kind of mini prairie mix or, uh, you know, just some forbs, something like that where it's, um, it's going to be less maintenance and more environmental benefit than turf grass, but um, a tree is just, it's a waste of a tree and it's a waste of your time to try to grow one there. Um, so just, you know, really think about that. Go out and go out and go to the botanical gardens and find a, a nice mature specimen of the tree you're thinking about planting and look at how big it is. So what's wrong with this planting? There's a lot wrong with this planting. If you see uh, all the soil mounded up against the root ball, all this, you know, the stake was still left on here. It looks like there's some, some plastic wrap still around the trunk. No root flare, no mulch. 
this tree is in the process of being girdled and it's destroying the sidewalk. Um, just wasn't an appropriate place to put this. And so this can happen to a, to a tree that gets girdled if it gets big enough. Um, as that tissue underneath the girdling root starts to die, um, it can start to rot and you'll get a, you know, a butt rot or something like that, that uh, actually significantly weakens that wood, just eats away at the wood and all you're left with is this kind of spongy mass that the fungus has already stripped of its lignin or something like that. And, um, and then if the right kind of weather event occurs, it's just gonna break and you're gonna get total failure where it fails at the root ball. But, you know, like I said, typically the tree's gonna start to die before it gets to that size. So a girdling root like this, I would actually remove that and hope for the best. Typically a tree can sustain 25 to 33% cambium loss. Um, this is probably getting close to that territory, but also, you know, the cambium underneath this root isn't necessarily totally dead. Um, so if you remove that root, there's always a chance that the tree could recover. It's probably going to be very stressed for a certain period of time. But like I said, I would, on this tree, I would try to remove that root. It can be very difficult to do. Again, you're going to want to cut it in two places and remove the center out of it, because otherwise that that root is likely to just kind of graft back onto itself. And you want to be sure not to cut into the main trunk when you're doing this. And that's really um, really the tricky part. You can use like a wood chisel to do it. Um, you can use a saw if you're really careful. It's, um, it's kind of, it varies. It's different for every situation. When you do, um, I tell you, I've done this a few times where when I finally get through that root, um, it pops, like pops away from the trunk because there's so much pressure built up in there. And uh, it's an incredibly satisfying feeling when you do that. You can almost feel the tree thanking you. Um, you know, if you're not comfortable, there are definitely arborists that have done this many times um, that will do it for you and do it without damaging the tree. And so that's the end of the main presentation. Um, during the original presentation, unfortunately, um, you know, because of our technical issues, I wasn't get to these last few slides that I that I added on here recently. Um, so these are just some of my kind of my top picks for trees for some various locations. Some of them for for very difficult locations. So these are all I say native-ish. Um, I'll address that point by point. Um, some of them are what we call native R's, where it's a native tree, but it's a cultivated variety of that tree. Um, again, native purists sometimes don't like those. And I understand why, especially with um, with a lot of our plants that are designed, to, uh, I shouldn't say designed, um, that attract pollinators, you know, with very specific flower colors or shapes. And then you, you decide you want, you know, uh, what was you know, a purple cone flower, you want to have an orange one, and all of a sudden the pollinators can't find it. Um, you know, it can become a thing where you take this plant that has environmental benefits and you make it purely beneficial to, to the human eye, and you remove those benefits. Whereas a lot of these native trees, um, we actually still get a lot of those environmental benefits. But then we can take a native tree that wasn't particularly suitable for a certain cultivated setting, and we make it suitable. Um, so I am philosophically, I do not have an issue with that. And um, I think there are some great, great native R species. Um, and this is, you know, this is one of them. This is Sylvatica, black gum, Tupelo. I like to call it Tupelo. I think it sounds a little nicer than black gum. I don't know why it's called black gum. It doesn't have gum and it's not black. Whereas Tupelo sounds kind of nice. It's a Native American word. It's the city Elvis Presley was born in. It's a little more musical to my ears than black gum. So black gum is relatively slow growing. And uh, the, real, the real big selling point to black gum is fall color. I took this picture in Tower Grove Park last fall on like a stormy fall day. And uh, it just looks like, you know, it looks like this tree just caught on fire. It's just gorgeous. 
very small fruit. So uh, there are some, some native R varieties. Um, it is a native tree, so all cultivars of it are, are native R's. Wildfire, Green Gables. Um, there's, there's so many, I can barely keep up with them now. Um, this has always been kind of a favorite tree of uh, horticulturists and arborists and foresters. And it's starting to catch on in the nursery trade because we have all these really great cultivars. The, uh, the straight species has kind of an odd form. Sometimes it can grow nice and upright like this, but sometimes it, it just grows real wonky every which way. I've seen some of them that look almost more like crab apples than this. Um, so the, a lot of the cultivars control for that form to have a nice upright central leader, like we talk about how important that is for, for good tree structure. And some of the cultivars don't have fruit, um, which some of them do, like wildfire, I believe, still has fruit, which to me, I have never seen a black gum fruit on the ground. They're tiny. They're like the size of a pea, and birds really love them. So I would prefer to use a variety that has, uh, that still has the fruit, because then you're feeding the birds in addition to, uh, to getting this beautiful fall color. And the flowers are also very beneficial for pollinators. And in fact, uh, Tupelo honey, you know, Van Morrison wrote a song about it. It's a, uh, you know, famous for, I think it has a, there's something about its chemical composition, but it won't crystallize the way a lot of honey, honey does. It has less sucrose in it or, or something. I can't remember exactly. Um, but great tree all in all, um, great for pollinators, great for birds, great for us to look at um, and, and appreciate its beauty. Uh, one of my favorites. And I think like I said, if you talk to many, many plant people, you're going to find it's pretty common favorite. So this to me is the great street tree of the future. Maclura palmifera white shield. This is an Osage orange. And normally Osage orange is like maybe the most inappropriate street tree you could ever think of plant. Because not only is it covered in thorns, especially the new growth, but it drops those gigantic fruit that could, you know, dent a car. I think if one of those hit you on the head, if you were walking underneath it, it could probably knock you out cold. Um, so what's really unique about white shield, no fruit and no thorns. It's a, it's just a male cultivar. So Osage orange is dioecious. It has a male and a female plant. And if you can just get a male plant, you don't get that fruit. But then they've gone one better and they've they found a variety. This was found down in Oklahoma by a by a nurseryman. Um, can't remember, can't remember the guy's name, but um, but it's been propagated again from cutting. So this is grafted onto a rootstock. The rootstock, if it does sucker, will have thorns on it. So beware if you have to cut the suckers off of the rootstock on a white shield of sage orange. But what's What's bizarre about Osage orange is that it grows really fast, like two feet a year easily, maybe even three feet. I've planted some of these that I'm pretty sure grew three feet in the first year of planting, which is kind of crazy because most trees grow zero feet in the first year of planting. This tree, three feet, and the wood is extremely strong. It's like one of the strongest woods, certainly in North America and probably on earth. It's just loaded with, uh, antibacterial and antifungal chemicals. Um, this used to be popular to make, uh, to make, not only would they make hedges out of it, um, just by planting it and, and hedging it, you know, cutting it down, but you can make fence posts out of it because it won't rot when you put it in the ground um, because of, because it's so loaded with those antifungal antimicrobial properties. And uh, that also makes it extremely resistant to diseases and, uh, insect infestation. I've, I've never seen anything really bothering an Osage orange. Just incredibly tough tree. This is one whenever I was scrambling to get things watered in the summer. Osage orange was always one I, I knew I could skip a week and it would be fine. Very thick glossy leaf that retains its water very well. This isn't going to be an easy cultivar to find. Um, Forest Keeling sells it. If you want a bigger one, Pea Ridge Nursery out in Herman grows a certain amount of them. But to me, this has just huge potential for being a street tree for really problematic, uh, really just difficult 
junky areas where you can't get anything else to grow. Um, Osage orange isn't technically a Missouri native. It's really only native to a small little microclimate of like Oklahoma, uh, parts of Texas and Arkansas, I believe. But Native Americans were propagating this in Missouri even before uh, before Europeans got here because they value the wood so much it would make excellent wood for bows and arrows, which is where one of its other name, bow d'arc, comes from. Uh, comes from the French bois d'arc, which means bow wood. So willow oak is a great landscape oak. It's kind of becoming one of our go-to landscape oaks. Now that people are moving away from pin oak, pin oak is uh, very susceptible to chlorosis from high pH soils, which, as I've said, I think several times during this presentation, we deal with a lot of high pH alkaline soils in our urban and suburban environments. Part of that comes from the heavy clay content. Part of it comes from uh, runoff from concrete and things like that, which uh, is very alkaline material. But uh, willow oak's great for a lot of reasons, one of which is that it's pretty fast growing for an oak. Um, but the wood is still strong because it's an oak, even our faster growing oaks like northern red and willow oak, typically the red oak group is faster growing, but the wood is still still pretty strong. Um, but what's also great about uh, Quercus fellows is the leaves and acorns are the smallest you're going to find, certainly on a North American oak. Um, the acorns are maybe about a half inch. The leaves are very wispy. They resemble that of a willow, hence the name. Um, so as far as oaks to clean up after, this is definitely going to be the easiest oak to clean up after. Um, and it's very adaptable. So willow oak is uh, naturally going to be kind of like a floodplain, wettish area species. And uh, trees that are adapted to that kind of environment typically make good landscape trees because a floodplain in many ways resembles kind of compacted urban soils. Um, a floodplain tree needs to be able to cope with a low oxygen environment, which is what compacted soils give us. And also on a floodplain or even a, you know, an area by like an ephemeral stream or something like that, you might have Abund an abundance or even an overabundance of water, you know, the tree might be inundated for years. And then it might be in an in a area that has absolutely no water for, for several years too. So they're really, uh, they make the best uh, generalist species, which is part of the, part of the reason that willow oak is such a great landscape species because, uh, you know, when you're giving out just general landscape recommendations, it gets tricky if you want to use trees that are very finicky about where you plant them. So having these generalist species that can thrive in all sorts of environments is very useful. Kentucky coffee tree, um, another just really unique, uh, really beautiful native tree. So this picture down here shows the, uh, the compound leaf, which hopefully we all remember a compound leaf versus a simple leaf. This is the largest leaf of any tree in North America because it's bipinnately compound. Um, it's easy to grow grass under because it provides, a, not only does it provide kind of a dappled shade, I shouldn't say easy, it's easier than most trees to grow grass under because it provides this dappled shade because of that leaf structure. And then because you have this huge leaf um, that Absizes kind of early in the year and comes out kind of late in the year. Um, you get more spring and more fall time when this tree doesn't have leaves on it, which, um, you know, you're sacrificing a little bit in terms of shade, but um, I know it's get popular with some golf courses because it's easier for them to, they can have a tree, you know, they have that nice large landscape architectural feature of having a tree, but they can actually have decent turf under it. The typical issue with Kentucky coffee tree is that it has this huge seed pod. So if you're in an area where that kind of large fruit is an issue, Kentucky coffee tree is not the tree for you. But there is a, the one I'm aware of, I think there's more than one, but there's a cultivar called espresso that is, again, Kentucky coffee tree is Dioecious, if you see that scientific name, it says Gymnocladus dioecious. That means dioecious. It means there's a male and a female. 
And espresso is, it's simply a male cultivar. And Kentucky coffee tree is also a bottomland species. So it's adaptable, um, it's adaptable to, to high pH and it can tolerate salt. Celtis occidentalis hackberry. This is kind of one of our alley cat trees. You know, it's a little bit weedy. Uh, it's an early successional species, but it's very fast grower. It's tolerant and adaptable. Um, it's just a tough tree. You know, it's not the it's not the prettiest thing. It can be slightly messy. Um, it does get fruit. It's beneficial for birds, but some of that fruit might fall on your car or something like that. So. Uh, um, so there is a little bit of a compromise, but for me, what it makes up for, it makes up for that with just how tough it is and how adaptable it is. The bark on, uh, the bark on hackberry is very cool, very warty, and you can actually get really nice fall color on hackberry too. Um, they do, they can get witch's broom and leaf galls, um, which can be aesthetic issues. Um, there are cultivars of hackberry that are a little less susceptible to that. Um, but it's a it's a good tree for wildlife, and um, just a really tough, adaptable tree. So for some more kind of ornamental um, ornamental options here, to me the best magnolia to grow around here. Other than we do have a native magnolia to Missouri, which is a cucumber tree, which is just um, a massive shade tree, and the flowers aren't particularly ornamental. Um, they're green, so they tend to blend in with the leaves. And also because it's such a large tree, they're usually too far off the ground to see. Magnolia virginiana is not native. It's native to, I believe, like Kentucky and Tennessee, so a little bit further south, but it does well here. It's a relatively fast growing magnolia. It'll tolerate more shade than most of the other cultivated magnolias. And the flowers are really nice. They're really very fragrant. Um, it blooms later in the year, kind of, uh, I want to say maybe just before Southern Magnolia, kind of around the same time. And the flower, the smell is similar to that of Southern Magnolia too. Very, uh, very nice lemony, sweet smell. Really great, uh, just beautiful ornamental and fragrant ornamental for a uh, you know, a smaller part of your landscape. These, these aren't going to get very big. Um, maybe 20 feet by 20 feet would be like a really large sweet bay magnolia. Service berry. Um, this is probably my favorite small ornamental tree all in all, because it's just got something every time of the year. It's beautiful. Um, they're about to flower right now. Beautiful white flowers in the spring, which give way to these just absolutely delicious berries that taste kind of like blueberries. Um, and then really spectacular fall color too, like kind of a pumpkin orange, uh, lovely fall color. The bark is um, a nice gray, can almost be a little bit silvery at times. Um, so a nice winter structure too. Uh, like I said, you know, a plant for all seasons, just fantastic. Um, can be a little tricky to, to transplant sometimes. I, I would prefer to use a container grown service berry. Um, I just list this as Amelanker species because there's, there's a, a variety of different species and finding a nursery that actually knows what species, what species they're selling you can be tricky. The, the most common one you're probably gonna find is Amelanker grandiflora, which is a cultivar. Um, but it's still, um, you know, birds love these berries regardless of which species or cultivar of service berry you have. The flowers are, uh, you know, they're gonna be beautiful and beneficial to pollinators regardless of what kind of service berry you have. Um, so it doesn't particularly matter. Um, people, people say that the name service berry comes from, because they bloom when the ground starts to thaw and it used to be people knew that when the service berries were bloom blooming you could dig a grave um that's not true it actually comes from this uh this fruit resembles the fruit of sorbus which is a plant that grows in europe and sorbus when uh 
when our ancestors came over here from Europe, they, they pronounced it Sarvis in the old English accent that was being used back in, uh, you know, the, the 16, 1700s. And they called this Sarvis because it, they would typically just call something, when they would encounter a new plant here, they would call it by the name of the most similar plant they knew in Europe. So this became the Sarvis tree because it reminded them of the Sarvis that, that grew back in England. And then that became service because if you say service, it sound, makes you sound kind of like a hillbilly. Um, and then this whole folk etymology of the service berry came about. Just interesting tidbit there. Corner, Cornus alternifolia is a, a really beautiful native dogwood. And in my opinion, a better, better tree to plant in a lot of conditions than Cornus Florida, which is our state tree. And Cornus Florida is obviously a beautiful tree. There's a reason it's in so many people's front yards, but there's also a reason why it doesn't look that good in so many people's front yards. Cause it's a, it's a tree that likes to be in a nice um, kind of sheltered woodland setting. And we put it in poor soil and in a windy sunny area um, right next to our house, you know, where there's uh, some some construction rubble in the soil and, and all these things like that that put it under a lot of stress and it gets anthracnose and leaf blights and things like this. Um, whereas Cornus alternifolia pagoda dogwood is, from what I've seen, from the plantings I've seen, it's a little tougher, um, less susceptible to those diseases, a little more adaptable. It also has a really interesting uh, growth habit. It's called pagoda dogwood because the branches kind of sweep out the way uh, you know, pagodas you see in, uh, in like China and Chinese architecture um, has that very, very tiered habit, as you can see being displayed here. The stems are kind of a lustrous, smooth, dark color, so really beautiful in the winter. And uh, it's called Cornus alternifolia because it's actually the only, um, the only dogwood that's alternate as opposed to being opposite. So it'll also mess with your ID skills and kind of keep you on your toes when it comes to identification. So another one of my favorites, this is probably, this is probably all in all my favorite tree is a uh, Carpinus Caroliniana. And I include all these common names just, uh, just to, as a reminder and a cautionary tale that scientific names are better because depending on where you are and who you're talking to, someone might call this the American hornbeam or the ironwood or the musclewood or the blue beech. Um, to me, the, the great feature of Carpinus is the, is the bark. It's just, uh, or the trunk. I, don't, I mean, the bark is so thin. I don't know if it's right to call this feature the bark. Um, it looks, it has this fluted, to me, muscle wood is probably the most descriptive, uh, descriptive common name because it does, you know, look like muscle. It looks, you know, that contorted sinewy, sinewy appearance. Hornbeam actually comes from a German hornbaum, which just means horn tree, um, which was a reference to just how hard the wood is. This is also one of our strongest trees. Um, this is, I think someone asked about the best tree for kids to climb on. This would be my nomination because it's, the wood is super strong. So you're not gonna have to worry about it breaking under their weight. The bark is very smooth, so it's not gonna scuff your hands up. And it also, uh, the habit makes it, you know, branches low to the ground, so it'd be easy to get into, but it's also not gonna get so high that if you fall out of it, you're gonna, you know, break your leg or anything like that. The fall color on, uh, on Carpinus can be really beautiful too. Um, it's not totally consistent. There is a cultivar called uh, Native Flame that was bred specifically for its fall color. That's gonna be consistently beautiful in that regard. And to me, this is a, a fantastic native alternative to Japanese maple. It really reminds me um, in its growth habit of Japanese maple and that, um, that smooth, really beautiful bark in the fall color, you're not going to find a variety of it that's going to have purple leaves all year long like a Japanese maple, but this is going to be much more beneficial to native wildlife um, and more adaptable, easier to grow than Japanese maple. So I'm not going to win any points for originality by recommending a red bud. Um, and red buds probably are overplanted, but there's a reason they're overplanted. They're just, they're so tough. They're very adaptable. They'll grow anywhere. Um, 
it's just kind of a no brainer plant. Other than trees that don't make it through establishment and die when they're young, I don't think I've ever seen a red bud actually die. Once they're established, they just, what I always say is red buds don't die, they just overstay their welcome. Um, they get to be just big, nasty, they fall apart. There's an amazing one in Tower Grove that I really love that basically just looks like a rotten log sticking out of the ground with like one live branch coming off of it. But that's, you know, in the right setting, that can be a, a beautiful feature and, you know, kind of a more wild native looking garden. And um, even in a more formal setting, you can use red buds if you if you prune them diligently. Um, you can even do rejuvenation pruning. You could, um, if a red bud is established, I've seen many times where a red bud has been removed and the stump wasn't ground out and it comes back as like a bush. So I think you could probably just rejuvenate prune um, a well-established red bud and, uh, and, you know, keep that, you know, vigorous, uh, young, supple growth rather than letting it get old and kind of falling apart. The flowers are edible. Um, they're very consistent. You know, you never, you never really see a bad year for red bud flowers like you might for, uh, for a lot of other species. So, um, that's, I'm just going to kind of end on that note. Like I said, you know, it's a no brainer. It's, it's unoriginal for me to suggest, but it's a good reminder that, um, you know, there's a reason why, why red buds get used so much. They're also, they're not a lot of diseases are going to plague them. And like I said, if they do, they're not going to kill it. They're just going to kill some of its wood off and you can hack that wood off, get some new rejuvenation. And, uh, you know, it's going to just keep on looking good until, uh, you know, like I said, if you remove a red bud, it's, it's probably not because it's dead. It's probably just because it got really just kind of ugly. So uh, with that, I'm going to wrap this up. Obviously, there are no questions because I'm just talking to myself here because this is a re-recording of a presentation that we lost the original recording to. So with that, thank you all and good evening.